Bialystok Fabris, Fabrishni, which is actually something my father mentioned in a, a, a testimony he gave as being the very station from which the transport he was in was sent to Auschwitz. Well, we're, we're standing in a very uh, poignant place here. It's in a small railway bridge across the railway line where people from the Bialystok ghetto were taken. I understand the ghetto was liquidated in 16th of August 1943 and uh, the Jews were brought across from the ghetto over there to the railway station here. The majority went to Treblinka, which was down that way. Um, in my personal um, history case, um, my father was one of the people uh, transported from the ghetto to a train, but he actually went the other way towards Warsaw and Auschwitz. My father, father's name was Jacob Lifshitz. He uh, was born in Bialystok in, on the 16th of November 1912. Um, his father was a manufacturer who uh, lived in Bialystok. Um, he, was a, um, he was in the textile um, industry, but not in terms of having his own um, plant or factory, but rather he used to put out to people and then take that stock to the factory owners. And I'm sure one of the factory owners he would have taken his stock to um, was a relative um, by the name of Sokol, who owned a very large factory in Bialystok. Um, and my father also became a, a, a weaver uh, in, a, in a business that, where they put out to the large factories. He was very successful in business through the 1920s and my family at that stage lived in a, a very big apartment in the middle of Bialystok. They lived um, in, in a very comfortable middle-class way. I, I have a photograph of the family in, uh, from the mid-1920s, and from the dress and so on, you could see that certainly um, very well attired and uh, obviously uh, a, a living a comfortable life. Well, largely secular, um, but not entirely. I, I, I would have thought that there was some um, religious observance going to synagogue on Saturdays and, and so on, but not a, a religious family in, in any um, you know, particular way, but a more a traditional family rather than uh, especially observant. Um, what happened, of course, with the Great Depression, I, I understand this had a very uh, major impact on um, the textile industry in uh, Bialystok in the 1930s and one of the economic casualties of this severe downturn um, was in fact uh, my grandfather, uh, my father's father. His business went bad, I think he became bankrupt. Um, they had to move house, um, they moved to a smaller accommodation. Um, my um, father, uh, he 
went to Hebrew schooling. In fact, his Hebrew schooling was good enough that um, some uh, 50 years, 60 years later, when he was in Israel for some time, he actually picked up Hebrew very quickly and spoke Hebrew very well. So he certainly had a good Hebrew education. He was always someone interested in um, trades, skilled work type of uh, work. And one of those areas that he learned at school was in metallurgy. Um, and of course, that was to prove um, ultimately the fact that saved his life in Auschwitz, that he um, was able to work in a metallurgy workshop and uh, that enabled him to survive uh, two years in Auschwitz. Germans uh, in invaded Poland at the beginning of the Second World War and I think it took them uh, three or four weeks and they'd more or less covered the country. I'm not sure the exact date the Nazis entered Bialystok, but it must have been before the end of September 1939. So there were a, a series of atrocities at that stage where you've uh, seen, for example, the burning of the Great Synagogue and uh, a, a number of other such events. Um, this came to a halt uh, with the um, pact with the Russians, the Molotov-Ribbentrop. So the Germans withdrew, the Russians came in. The Russians took over his um, small factory that he had. He was a weaver um, in the textile business, which seems to be a, a, a sort of an extended family business in Bialystok. He was in an anti-aircraft uh, unit, artillery unit, um, but the officers ran away as the, uh, as the uh, Germans approached and um, he was left just going home to Bialystok. went into the ghetto, um, which was created by the uh, Germans on their um, revisit. And my father had a job with the Wehrmacht, the German army, in an office or in a furniture depot. And so his work entailed leaving the ghetto and um, working um, during the day in this German um, army depot, moving furniture. And actually, he was a very good furniture mover for the rest of his life, but I never quite got to associate his furniture moving skills with his work at this time till quite a bit later. At that time, my father was married um, to a woman by the name of uh, Fania, whose maiden name was Quintman, and they had a son, um, Abraham, Avram. I think my, father, my father's father had already died uh, of uh, a cancer or some illness, so my father had to look after his mother, um, his wife and young son, who I think was born around 1935. One of the ways of supplementing the income um, was through smuggling contraband in and out of the ghetto, but of course the penalties for discovery were usually summary uh, execution. Um, and my father struck up a friendship with an elderly um, German soldier who worked in this store. Um, and I think uh, the German soldier was kind enough to occasionally give him soap um, with the Wehrmacht stamp on it that my father would then exchange for bread or other such food uh, in order to better um, feed the family that he was, felt responsible for. One day, while he was doing this, um, he was searched uh, entering the ghetto. They had various ways of hiding things, but uh, on this occasion he was discovered. Um, but instead of being executed straight away, which was usually the case, um, he was put into the prison um, that the Nazis had um, in Bialystok, the uh, Bialystok jail. My father, I wasn't sure why this happened, but he did speculate that maybe he was kept there in order to give evidence at some future time as to how come German army soap found its way into the hands of a Jew um, who'd left the ghetto and was discovered with soap coming into the ghetto. Of course, that was a criminal offence. He then um, spent some uh, uh, 12 months or 11 months and in the uh, prison, 
Um, he certainly was witness to um, a very large number of executions in the courtyard. Uh, that was a regular occurrence. Um, actually, as was often the case with ironies during the war, it was that imprisonment that um, actually saved his life. Of course, he would have thought at any time the knock on the door would come and he'd be the next in the groups to be um, shot against the wall in the courtyard. That didn't happen. He did, in fact, uh, witness uh, the execution of many, many people uh, from his window on the third floor, I think, of the uh, prison. He was in cell block 64. Anyway, no beds. Uh, they just uh, slept on the uh, concrete. And, of course, in those conditions, typhus was quite rife. Um, so my father actually contracted typhus, which gave extremely high fever. But somehow he survived. And in doing so, he built up the uh, antibodies that were uh, going to be extremely valuable in preserving his life. One of the reasons he was able to survive um, and not contract typhus, as many did, was because he'd already um, built up the immunity through that time in prison. So anyway, he was there uh, in prison, released, I think it was in um, March of 1943, um, released into the ghetto. Gestapo were looking for him after his release and someone in the building um, was an informant and the arrangement was that they would leave a spade, a shovel, up against his door to indicate he was in the house um, so that the, the Germans would come uh, and find him there. He was in a transport, I think of some 12,000 people, to Auschwitz. Uh, I understand that Treblinka was by far the um, more usual destination for Bialystok Jews than Auschwitz, but my father did go to Auschwitz. As he said, rather unusually, he went in a passenger train to Auschwitz, which uh, was, uh, I suppose, like travelling first class instead of um, in a cattle wagon. Both my parents were Holocaust survivors who went to Australia in 1946 after the Second World War. The Holocaust period in my growing up was always this sort of black hole uh, full of somehow historical fragments that were all in a way disconnected. Um, it's only really been as I've gotten older after both of them passed away. My fa mother passed away in 1994 and my father in 2003. I think that in a funny sort of way, the past gets closer to one as one gets further away from it in a funny sort of way. So um, I was actually quite ignorant, apart from certain stark pieces of information. Um, I was born in Australia in 1950, but I didn't speak English till I went to school when I was, say, five years old. Um, for the first four years of my life, um, uh, the, the first language I learned was Yiddish. Uh, my father certainly came from a Yiddish-speaking um, background. Yiddish was his predominant language, but he was very um, fluent, obviously, in Polish, and um, he would always um, d you know, converse in Polish with those of his friends who preferred to speak Polish rather than Yiddish. There were some friends, I think, from Warsaw that were um, university educated and so on, and they tended to speak in Polish. As is often the case with children, they like to speak the language of the street, the language of school, the language of their friends. So I think my father at one stage uh, felt he was fighting a losing battle, trying to speak to me in Yiddish. I would respond in English. And unfortunately, um, while I've retained some Yiddish language, uh, I've lost a lot of it. So, but um, my parents, um, really in Australia, um, spoke a, a mixture of languages. I'm a graduate of, of 
very fine learning. My early education was at a very great educational institution. It was called the Bialystoker Centre Kindergarten. And so obviously in these ways I, I picked up uh, a lot about uh, Bialystok. I don't know what it was, something in me just triggered an urge to come to Poland to maybe better understand the sort of life they led or what they did to survive the war or something of that sort. Um, so here I am trying to uh, somehow in a way one tries to get closer to the past. Now that I'm here it's uh, somehow it's a, a very uh, I wouldn't call it challenging, it's a very curious and a, a very um, interesting experience to actually see Bialystok in, a, in some sort of physical form um, as it is today. My opinion of Poland, I think, changed dramatically through coming here, you know, like, um, in a way, I, I didn't know what to expect. I, I assumed that I would be on this emotional roller coaster. Um, at the same time, I'm travelling with my daughter, so I'm, I was always determined that she'd be enjoying herself and we'd be going out and we'd drink vodka and go to bars and do all those things, as well as, you know, the sort of family stuff. You know, really, I, I've just found Polish people to be uh, incredibly friendly and helpful and, uh, I guess, Whenever you come to a place, you realise the complexities of the situation. It's often easy to fall back on simple um, generalisations. And I, I, I'm obviously convinced through being here that those generalisations are not true, you know. Look, if you come to Poland, it's not different to actually travelling in Italy or Spain or one of those sort of places where, you know, everyone expects to enjoy themselves entirely. I don't think Poland's that different. It's uh, such an interesting country with a lot of, uh, you know, the street festivals, the street theatre that we saw in Krakow, and uh, I felt they were people I could really warm to, and I develop a good understanding of complex, multicultural issues, um, and uh, those sorts of things, I think, have exceeded my expectations of what Poland is like as a, as a country country and what Polish people are like. As many people have already said, uh, Bialystokers are very uh, curious people. They have a very strong sense of belonging. Um, so obviously my father being from Bialystok, a lot of his friends were from Bialystok, so I often heard these fragments of some mystical kingdom uh, across the sea and where the life was quite different and no longer exists. Now the Holocaust period was uh, obviously uh, the, or the destruction of Poland Jews and the destruction of the community in Bialystok um, you know, was a, a, a obviously a, a, a great uh, tragedy that can't really be expressed in words. But I think it's also incomplete not to mention something about what it took to survive that and not only survive it, but then to go on and build really um, loving and constructive lives um, as both my parents did. Uh, they brought up uh, a children, two children in a family. I have a sister, Linda, and um, the, the fact that they were able to do that in a, in a loving environment, but also in an environment that valued um, human nature, was positive about human nature, um, saw good in people uh, almost always. Um, to me, that, that also, is, is an important part, you know. I, I think that as time has gone on and we've moved further away from the tragedy of the Holocaust and the horror of the Holocaust, I, I think it's also opportune to reflect on just how um, courageous and, um, you know, just how indebted I am um, just to what my parents were able to achieve despite the horrors that they had to live through.